Good evening, everyone. Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. I am Dr. Michelle Johnson, and I serve on the board of the Association of Black Cardiologists and as chair of the ABC nominating committee. The Association of Black Cardiologists, for those of you who are not familiar, was founded in 1974 and is a nonprofit organization dedicated to eliminating disparities in cardiovascular disease in people of color. The organization has both public and private partnerships and has managed over the past 47 years to have significant impact in cardiovascular disease in vulnerable populations. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here in what is a third of a table talk series designed by the Women and Children Committee of the ABC. And tonight's program is called Heart of Gold, Heart Health from the Postpartum Period and Beyond. The ABC remains committed to focusing on vulnerable populations and tonight's lens is cast on black women. We continue to suffer disparate outcomes in cardiovascular disease and adverse outcomes in particular plague black women at all points along the lifespan. It's for this reason that the work of this committee and the leadership of doctors Rachel Bond and Annette Ansong is so vital. I'll also share with you that the ABC is also vitally committed to development of the next generation of leaders and clinicians as we build a pipeline for the future. And in this spirit, it's tremendously exciting to acknowledge that tonight's event was arranged by two fellows who also serve on the committee, Drs. Mary Branch and Drs. Joyce Jorgogi. We're excited to see a distinguished panel that's assembled for what I know will be a stimulating program and look forward to interesting conversations after this. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Good evening, everyone. We started the Table Talk series to highlight the spectrum of cardiovascular disease from childhood to women in their reproductive years to older women. We also wanted to highlight the disparities that can occur to women of color seeking cardiovascular care. It is our hope that you'll find this series educational, engaging, enlightening, and empowering. Heart of Gold, the event that we're having tonight, seeks to highlight those cardiovascular issues from women from the time when they give birth to when they enter menopause. Without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce you to the other co-hosts. They include my co-chair, Dr. Rachel Bond, who is Systems Director for Women's Heart Health at Dignity Health in Arizona, and then to our two adult cardiology fellows, Dr. Joyce Jiroke at University of California, San Francisco, and Dr. Rachel, sorry, Dr. Mary Branch at Wake Forest Medical Center. Dr. Bond, if you could go ahead and introduce our amazing guest panelists for this evening. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Ansong. And as uh, Dr. Ansong mentioned, we are just so thrilled for this uh, wonderful discussion. We know that you're going to learn a lot and we look forward to questions that you may have at the end. Our first uh, panelist who we're very esteemed to have is Dr. Amber Johnson. Dr. Johnson is an assistant professor of medicine and clinical assistant professor of clinical as well as translational sciences at the University of Pittsburgh. She completed her undergraduate degree with honors at the University of Pittsburgh. She then completed her medical degree and master's of business administration at Jefferson Medical College, Widner University in Philadelphia. In addition to a year of patient safety and quality improvement training at the Armstrong Institute of John Hopkins Hospital, she was an internal medicine resident at John Hopkins Bayview in Baltimore. She then returned to Pittsburgh for a general cardiology fellowship, a research fellowship, and a master's degree in clinical research from the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Johnson's research as at the interface of health equity, social determinants of health and mobile health technology as resulted in numerous publications as well as federal granting funding. She is a recipient of many local as well as national clinical and research awards. She on her free time also enjoys cooking, running and spending time with her family and she's the mother of two very young daughters, Leilani and Nia. 
Our next uh, esteemed panelist is Dr. Sharon Hayes. Dr. Hayes is a professor of cardiovascular medicine and she founded as well as maintains an active clinical practice in the Women's Heart Clinic at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Hayes has long advocated for the advancement of women's health as well as sex-based medicine within the field of cardiology, as well as many other areas that affect women's health and well-being. Dr. Hayes previously served as Mayo's Clinic's first Director of Diversity and Inclusion from 2010 through 2020, with leadership set strategies for di diversity and inclusion activities across Mayo Clinic. She did develop solutions for equity in both patient care as well as the workforce. Dr. Hayes' research interests do include sex and gender specific based cardiology, as well as spontaneous coronary artery dissection, health equity, as well as participation of women and minorities in medical research, healthcare workforce equity, and the utility and optimal role of social media in clinical practice, medical research, and health education. Our next esteemed panelist is Dr. Biljana Parapid. Dr. Parapid is an assistant professor of medicine at Belgrade University School of Medicine in Belgrade, Serbia, and an honorary proctor of the W. Harvey Teaching Professor at Georgetown University School of Medicine in Washington, DC. She received part of her medicine residency training at Georgetown University Hospital, as well as her fellowship from Paris, uh, university. Um, and that enabled her to help relaunch a heart transplant program in Serbia back in 2013. She's extremely passionate about sex disparities and health disease, as well as cardio obstetrics. And Dr. Parapid made her med school dream come true by bringing the Go Red for Women campaign to Serbia in 2018 and formally turned her clinic since um, becoming an attending in 2006 into the Dr. Nanette Kais Wanger Women's Heart Center as the first in the region and the third in Europe. And it will open very soon in late 2020 and it actually has since been opened. Our last presenter is Dr. Jessica Shepard. Uh, Dr. Shepard is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist and she's the chief medical officer for Ve Very Well Health. She is the founder and the CEO of Sanctum Med and Wellness as well, which is a wellness concierge practice. She is affiliated with Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Beyond that, she went on to complete a vast majority of her training, specifically her fellowship in minimally invasive gynecology at the University of Louisville, where she also earned her MBA. She also serves as the director of minimally invasive gynecology at the University of Illinois um, in her previous uh, stay when she was in Illinois for approximately six years. She's well known to the media bracket and has appeared regularly as an expert on Good Morning America, the Today Show, The Talk, Dr. Oz, CNN, MSNBC, as well as CBS News. And she's extremely passionate on women's health as well as minority health disparities. So we are so fortunate to have her here today. Now with that esteemed panel, we're really in for a treat and we really look forward to actually starting our program now. If you could advance the slides, please. What we really wanted to discuss in terms of the heart of this particular talk, um, moving the slides forward, is the fact that when we think about women and cardiovascular disease, we know that it is, it is our leading threat, particularly in the sense that it accounts for about one in four deaths per year. The term cardiovascular disease is a really a broader umbrella term that could range anywhere from abnormal rhythms of the heart, issues with the valves in your heart, even issues with the pumping function of the heart. But when we think about it, we usually always think about particularly any plaque or blockages in the arteries of the heart, arteries in the neck or uh, arteries in our brain, or even sometimes blockages in the arteries of our legs. And we know that there are women, particularly that are at higher risk for this, but the fact of the matter is all women, irrespective of our race and ethnicity, heart disease is their leading threat and something that we really need to learn about because 80% of the time, it's something that we could prevent. If you could advance the slides forward, Now, as I made mention of, there are disproportionately more groups that actually have higher rates and threats from cardiovascular disease. We decided to really focus in on our black community because that's where we're seeing the highest rates. And when we look at black women and cardiovascular disease, nearly one in every two black women has heart disease. 
And that's actually above the age of 20. 50% of African-American women above the age of 20 have some form of cardiovascular disease, many of which the leading cause in terms of a risk factor is elevated blood pressure or hypertension. And as a black female, there's an even higher chance of dying, especially at a younger age. Advancing the slide forward, the fact is, is despite these statistics, we know that about two out of every three black women don't actually know how big an issue heart disease is. And we really wanna make sure that it's time that that changes, that we actually change the dialogue and we allow you the tools to understand what your risks are, but more importantly, how to prevent yourself from being one of these statistics. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to one of our amazing fellows who created a very fantastic case presentation. We're going to walk through that case, we're going to dissect that case, and we're going to learn from our esteemed panelists. So at the end of that case, you'll understand the tools, you'll understand the statistics, but more importantly, you'll understand how to prevent a condition that's preventable again 80% of the time. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Jiroge, and I look forward to our discussions. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm, my, my name is Dr. Jiroge. I am one of the cardiology fellows at UCSF. Um, let me introduce you to Alexis. So she's a 40-year-old Black woman with obesity and three prior pregnancies who is now four weeks postpartum. She is relatively healthy otherwise, although does not follow up regularly with her general practitioner. Her second pregnancy was complicated by preeclampsia with severe features, leading to premature labor at 36 weeks. This recent pregnancy was uncomplicated. She is currently awaiting her follow-up postpartum appointment. So a question for the group. Which one of these conditions are risk factors for heart disease for Alexis? advanced age at pregnancy greater than 35 years old, history of preeclampsia, obesity, sporadic medical follow-up, racism, or all of the above. Okay, we can take a look at the results. Great, so all of the above, the answer is correct. Um, Conditions that can place a mother at higher risk for future cardiovascular disease do include advanced maternal age, along with predisposing traditional risk factors such as obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, tobacco use, sedentary lifestyle, and poor diet. These modifiable conditions are less controlled in the Black community for numerous reasons. In addition, we know that a prior history of adverse pregnancy outcomes, such as high blood pressure during pregnancy, gestational diabetes, preterm labor, or small for gestational age babies, these factors uh, into these factor into the development of heart disease as well. To answer the question of why Black women are the highest maternal risk group, the role of race and ethnicity uh, have to be addressed. But this is less to do with the biological differences and more to do with the social and structural factors. Next slide, please. Race, ethnicity, and social determinants of health can increase the maternal risk of developing gestational diabetes, peripartum cardiomyopathy, or heart failure during pregnancy, complications requiring C-section or preterm deliveries, and low birth weights, while independently increasing the risk of developing future heart disease. So Dr. Johnson, can you expand upon the social determinants of health, for example, how does your zip code affect your healthcare and health outcomes? Yes, I'd be happy to expand on that. And it's an excellent question. Um, some of the research that I do looks at people's neighborhood using an index called the Area Deprivation Index. And basically it's a measure of things like socioeconomic status, um, access to education, income, a number of different factors that get comp compiled to determine how worse off one community is in relation to another. And what we found is that the, the more troubled communities, the more troubled areas have uh, patients who are more likely to be admitted to the hospital, 
they're more likely to be um, to die within a year from a cardiovascular reason. And some future work that I'd like to explore is why is that? What, it, what is it about one's neighborhood, the built environment, as well as the social context within that environment that are associated with negative outcomes? Um, there's some work to suggest that uh, the social context within neighborhoods can actually be protective as well. So I would like to understand what are some, some good things and some bad things that exist within communities so that we can enhance the good things and, and overcome any barriers. Great, that's all very interesting. Um, interestingly also, um, it appears higher income and higher level of education do not protect black women from maternal complications and overall negative health outcomes. Why do you think this is the case? Yeah, that's also very interesting. There's this paradox almost that um, despite being of a higher socioeconomic status, a, a higher education, um, having a higher income, that Black race is, uh, despite those, those things, trying to correct for those things, Black race is associated with negative outcomes. And we see it with maternal uh, fetal disparities. And we also see that when it comes to cardiovascular disease. And so there's something else going on, right? It's not just income. It's not just um, being upwardly mobile within a social strata, but there's, there are other things um, which, you know, if you ask a, a black person, the answer is obvious, like obviously it's racism, right? But how do, you, how do you prove that? How do you determine what that mechanism is scientifically? And so there are a lot of really smart people. There are a lot of um, people who are very passionate about this subject, who are doing the work to try and understand what it is about racism so that we can put policies in place so that we can um, really uh, strive towards social justice but then also that the people who are living in the situation as an individual, it may be impossible to overcome racism as an individual, but how can you, how can you thrive within, um, within racist environments? Uh, and so that, some of that are, are the, the questions that I hope to answer with my research. That's great. Yeah, I think you bring up an amazing point that with the lack of data, we can't really power systemic changes or structural changes. And so that's really the first step. And we're really happy and glad that you're you're pursuing that. Um, can you tell us what is the superwoman schema among black women? And how does that factor into premature disease and poor outcomes? Yeah, I think it's a great question. It's a complicated question, because I think there are a lot of like anthropo anthropologically speaking, right? I think that there are mechanisms in place that um, having been in adverse situations, for example, having survived slavery, having survived racism, having been in, um, in situations that, that lead to repetitive stress, um, have a negative toll on your health. And there have been a number of, of different theories that have been proposed. So the superwoman schema is uh, for, for black women in particular, there's also this concept of John Henryism where uh, for black men, where you try to power through these negative situations, um, repeated stress or um, be uh, uh, situations where you are highly scrutinized or highly criticized and trying to power through, trying to survive through those things. And so I think on the one end, it is viewed highly if you are able to do that, if you become accomplished, if you um, are to stay strong and, and you know, be quote unquote a tough cookie and, and make it through those negative situations and still be successful and still do it with grace and poise. Those things are looked at uh, upon highly from outsiders, but inside the stress that your body is undergoing uh, will lead to higher cases of hypertension, higher, ind higher indices of uh, depression. Uh, so mental health, physical health, all of those things, maternal health, all of those things are being negatively impacted by repetitive stress. And when you try to understand the physiologic mechanisms, we know that things like cortisol, which is a stress hormone, are higher. Um, there's been studies to show if you do a, a sample of a woman's hair, that black women have higher cortisol, which shows that over the course of time, it's not just a one time incident, but over the course of time, your body is building up a response to repetitive stress. 
Okay, thank you so much for going through that very important point. Um, Dr. Parapid, I was wondering if I could ask you, um, now that we know uh, Alexis has some risk factors for developing future heart disease, how can we, um, can we better explain for the audience what is preeclampsia and what are other cardiovascular complications of pregnancy that contribute to maternal morbidity and mortality? Well, first of all, thanks for having me tonight. It's a great pleasure to be uh, to be uh, back in the states, considering it's a pandemic. And <laughs> so, uh, sadly, when we talk about preeclampsia and eclampsia, I would like all of us to take a minute, especially if our patients are listening to us, and to recall Dr. Wallace, who was a chief pediatric fourth year resident at the University of Indiana, who who died in late October due to preeclampsia being complicated by eclampsia and she basically died of severe complications following her childbirth. So preeclampsia is actually a disorder of pregnancy which is characterized by the onset of high blood pressure and um, often a significant amount of protein in the urine. So if not treated in an adequate and timely fashion, it is a life-threatening condition for both mother and the child she's carrying and it's termed then eclampsia. Why eclampsia? It was first uh, described in, in fifth century BC by, by Hippocrates actually, because uh, lampsia in modern Greek is light and lightning is eclampsia in old Greek. So uh, sadly, uh, preeclampsia can deteriorate very fast to eclampsia and it starts with the shortness of breath, follows by kidney and liver, liver function deterioration further and accumulation of fluid in the lungs, which is also a um, presentation of, of uh, heart failure that goes along and eventually it can cause seizures. Risk factors for preeclampsia are usually pre-existent hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and advanced maternal age. If we talk about other cardiovascular complications, Dr. Bond already uh, cited a very important list that we all know, and those are actually all unattended either risk factors or cardiovascular diseases that were not diagnosed before the pregnancy or were not handled by, by uh, primary care healthcare physicians referring these patients in in their prenatal visits to a cardiologist. So it basically ranges from coronary artery disease, that is a blockage in the arteries, coronary arteries, the arteries of the heart, that usually happens with not so much symptoms in patients who are obese and have diabetes that we know uh, is uh, one of the risk factors that are rather prominent in, in black female population. Uh, finally, we also have a lots of congenital heart disease that was not diagnosed in time and corrected like Marfan syndrome that also has uh, uh, the walls of the arteries in, in, in Marfan syndrome are also not of the same high quality, so to say, as the normal arteries, so they handle worse the pressure. We know that uh, the, every woman who has seen a pregnant woman around her, if she hasn't been pregnant herself, knows the, the load goes up to almost, uh, now let me change metrics to imperials, but, but we're going almost up to 20 pounds of, of altogether fluid, placental weight, baby weight. So all of that altogether increases the volume, the circulating volume and increases blood pressure and and Marfan syndrome can, can very fast deteriorate to preeclampsia and eclampsia. So uh, I think that we can leave it at that. Of course, all the hypertensions that were not, not treated, they're scientifically, we, we recognize the different subsets, but basically what our patients should know is that if, if in any moment before they got pregnant, they had at least once an elevated blood pressure, they should at least start something that they can always do without their doctor and that is quit everything that is a uh, carbonated drink, quit, quit the, the additional um, adding salt to your food, changing your diet and really trying to, to work it that way. 
Thank you. That was very thorough. Um, one last question I have for you. Um, what are some signs or symptoms that patients can look out for when they may be concerned they're developing a complication after having um, complications of pregnancy? Well, what I usually love to say all my patients that I sadly meet in maternity, <laughs> if they develop the complication during their pregnancy, is that I usually tell them this was a warning, but that doesn't mean that these things are going to disappear. So uh, all feet swelling, shortness of breath, continuously being tired, although your follow-up uh, uh, blood work is fine, meaning you're not anemic anymore as you were immediately postpartum or during your pregnancy, which is kind of normal. So uh, sadly, we know that um, basically 33% of, of uh, maternal mortality can, up, can go up to one year after delivery. And in that regard, uh, we are trying actually to implement what ACOG, you also already mentioned that ACOG in 2018 uh, introduced new guidelines advising us to see these women actually within three weeks postpartum instead of the single six week visit. And then to add another 12 week visit afterwards. Uh, naturally, all of us, if we see these women in, in the wards, when on the floor, when they delivered, we try to see them even almost a week postpartum, but it's very difficult to grab hold of their attentions because every mother, once she, she has her bundle of joy in her arms and she's ready to go, she doesn't care so much about herself. So I think we have to sit, sit, sit them down and talk a lot and, you know, mix uh, the, uh, the sweet and the sour messages and uh, even occasionally scaring them a bit so that they understand that they are their, their ch child's best investment in the future mm -hmm. and the way they take care of their own health. That's, that's almost like paying them college tuition. That's a great segue <laughs> into the next point. Thank you, Dr. Parapet. Ne next slide, please. So um, with this background in mind, it's important to realize that the risk of developing complications related to pregnancy do not stop right after delivery, as Dr. Parapet nicely mentioned. One in eight maternal deaths occurs between 42 days and one year postpartum or after delivery. Not only do we need to increase awareness of this fact, but we need to make systemic changes, such as extending insurance coverage to at least a year in order to uh, prevent barriers to access to healthcare. Next slide, please. I have another question for the group. Um, knowing Alexis's background, what chronic diseases are, is she at risk for in the future? cardiovascular disease, including high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, and heart failure, breast cancer, diabetes, or all of the above. Okay. So this is great. You are exactly right. She is at risk of developing cardiovascular disease, but she's actually at risk of developing all of the above. Um, we will continue to discuss this further during this talk. But next slide. Let's right now, let's return to Alexis's story. So she presents to the emergency department at four weeks after delivery with chest pain and shortness of breath. She's initially turned away, diagnosed with having an anxiety attack and advised to follow up with an obstetrician and establish care with a primary care doctor. However, within 24 hours, she's back in the emergency room with ongoing symptoms and now on further evaluation, signs of a heart attack. She's taken for coronary angiogram to look at for blockages in the arteries of her heart and she's found to have spontaneous coronary artery dissection or SCAD. So next slide, I have a question for the group again. How often have you been to a healthcare provider and felt you were not listened to or had your concerns dismissed? Okay. Let's take a look at those results. Yeah. 
Sadly, this is not an uncommon occurrence. Although there is no direct data, we see the outcomes of especially Black women being silenced and unheard as we see higher rates of delayed diagnoses such as endometriosis and insufficient pain management for chronic pain syndromes or disorders, as well as complications of sickle cell disease. An important step towards improving outcomes, particularly in Black women, is to acknowledge our contributions as healthcare providers and to start listening to our patients' concerns. Healthcare professionals need more standardized training to reduce these obstacles that we've put up ourselves. Additionally, better patient education regarding warning signs and symptoms will Im improve our collaborative efforts in caring for these women. So Dr. Bond, Women often have their concerns about medical issues dismissed and are often turned away and sent home. Is there anything patients can do to address this or advocate for themselves? Or is this something that the medical field has to tackle itself? Yeah, no, that's a wonderful question. And I think the answer is twofold. One is from a patient level is really giving them, I think, the education behind what are the signs and symptoms they should be looking out for. We want to emphasize the fact that our female patients know their bodies better than we obviously do as clinicians. And if something does not feel right, it typically usually isn't. If you're feeling that these symptoms, the signs and symptoms are perseverating and ongoing, and you're your clinicians are dismissing you, I highly encourage you get a second opinion, a third opinion, maybe even a fourth opinion, because at the end of the day, that could be life or death. Beyond that, as you alluded to, we in the medical field have to do a better job at taking the time to listen to our patients. That's the first step. But also acknowledging that the, the spheres that they may have with what they're dealing with. Many of these mothers, be it during their pregnancy or postpartum, are grappling with the idea of being a new mom and their body is changing. Um, when we think about pregnancy, it is a stress test for all intents purposes and their body is changing. So we have to be very thoughtful thoughtful when those changes occur and not dismiss it. Because what can happen, just like with Alexis is, is we presume it's anxiety when at the end of the day, it's actually a heart attack. Exactly. Um, sorry, there's some background noise. So pregnancy is thought to be a stress test to unmask cardiovascular disease. So in this effort of improving, you know, our education of our patients so that they know what they should be looking for, or what they should be concerned about, what are some uh, medical conditions that should have been evaluated the first time that Alexis presented, especially knowing her past medical history and her pregnancy complication history? Yeah, so here we have Alexis. She is 40 years old, just had a baby four weeks ago. She has a history of obesity. Her prior pregnancy was unfortunately complicated by preeclampsia. And thankfully, this most recent delivery was uncomplicated. But as you very nicely heard from Dr. Parapid, these complications can occur what, up to one year postpartum. So as the emergency room clinicians, we really should have been thinking about that thinking about her risk factors and not dismissing the fact she's coming in with pain in her chest, coming in with shortness of breath. A standard thing would have been first step to at least get something called an electrocardiogram. That's basically allows us to look at the electricity through our heart. And it could be a warning sign that there is something pending such as a heart attack going on. Beyond that, checking blood work that could have helped us to figure out is she at risk of a heart attack? Is she actively having a heart attack? Or even to the same degree, is she possibly filling up with fluid in her lungs or other areas of her body? Many of which are very common things that occur during that immediate postpartum period. So there's so many things we could have done for Alexis beyond the fact of just sending her home. And unfortunately she was sent home, but because of the fact that she was advocating for herself, she came back to the hospital and we were able to manage her condition. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bond. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide and we'll chat with our um, specialist, Dr. Hayes. Um, okay, next slide. Thank you. I'd like to chat with our uh, specialist, Dr. Hayes, um, who will tell us a little bit more about SCAD. And maybe um, you can tell us who's at risk of developing it. Yeah, so fortunately, SCAD is a relatively 
uncommon cause of heart attack. In fact, Alexis has some risk factors for the regular kind of heart attack that comes with plaque. But she was at particular risk because she had just had a baby. And so SCAD, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, is a split between the layers of the heart. And this slide that's up for the diagram kind of shows that. You can see on the far left, you can see that the plaque buildup. That is more common, both in men and women, but particularly um, uh, as people age. But somebody who's otherwise completely healthy, who perhaps have some hormonal shifts, may develop this split. And you can see how that flap might block blood flow and cause a heart attack. So the individuals who are at risk for this are particularly, are any women, and this tends to be in women who are younger or middle-aged. There's a particular risk factor when they are recently pregnant. That first month after delivery, if somebody comes in with chest pain, we need to be thinking this could be a heart attack one, and it might not be a regular heart attack. It could be a dissection. And I think the, the Alexis story is so classic because if you don't look like a heart attack victim, the people who see you may not even do the tests that are necessary to diagnose it, like Dr. Bond uh, responded. So the risk for is younger women, women who may be otherwise healthy and who have classic heart attack symptoms, but maybe don't have so many risk factors. That's a great point. Um, and I think a lot of the symptoms we've been talking about, one of the biggest key points to realize is that younger women may not be the typical presenting patient for developing these complications. So these are all, this is all very important and helpful information. Um, what is the current recommendation for management of SCAD patients and how does that differ for, differ, uh, for women in particular, especially regarding future risk of developing um, recurrent SCAD and their you know, future family planning? So uh, I think that I would start by saying at the initial intake, when you call the 911 or you go to the emergency department, there is no difference. So women need to be taken seriously for the symptoms that they are having. So that I, I think that's the overarching. If you think something's wrong, it doesn't feel right. You go in, I don't care if you're 19 years old, you should have this checked out. On the other hand, once we recognize we have to take that woman seriously, we take her to the cath lab. That's where we do an angiogram and take pictures of her heart arteries. And it is there that we say, hey, we don't see plaque. She doesn't need cholesterol lowering medications. She needs some other tests and perhaps a different course of treatment. So it all gets back to the fact that women should listen to their bodies and that we as healthcare providers should listen to women and then use what we have learned to appropriately treat whether that woman, whether Alexis had had plaque or this dissection that she had, that we move forward. Great. That's incredibly powerful. Um, what should the long-term care for SCAD patients be? And what's the role of, let's say, cardiac rehab? So any patient who has a heart attack, and there's a number of other cardiac conditions that also qualify for cardiac rehabilitation, like heart failure. Cardiac rehabilitation, don't let any woman in our audience ever be told, oh, you don't need it if you have a qualifying event. If you have a heart attack or heart failure, cardiac rehabilitation has been shown to be one of the most powerful things that we can do to save your life. Um, the word rehab, I've heard from my women patients, they think that's for drug addicts, right? I don't like the word rehab, I want a different word. Well, we're stuck with the word, but what cardiac rehabilitation is, is a place to gain confidence in your body. So after a bad event, like a heart attack, you get to get on a treadmill with lots of friendly and helpful people monitoring you and saying, when you feel this twinge up here and they say, hey, everything's good, blood pressure's great, ECG is great. It helps you gain that confidence in your body and also in your brain, because it's really scary to have a diagnosis of heart disease. Mm -hmm. So the main thing for people with SCAD, not unlike people who have a regular type of heart attack, good blood pressure control for the rest of their life, some special imaging to make sure they don't have other problems. But the idea is learning to live with the new normal. And we could say that about a lot of things. Having a baby is a new normal, 
but having a heart attack or a new diagnosis of heart disease is a new normal. And we need to recognize that it, it doesn't go back to same old, same old. We may need a different dietary approach. We may need something different from our family, maybe less coddling, maybe more care. Don't expect mom who just had a heart attack to go back and do, do everything she did before. I think there's so much that changes and each individual woman, whatever type of heart disease that she has, needs to find that new normal and find the support that she needs. Thank you. And then briefly, I just wanted to ask about the rates of recurrence with SCAD specifically. And is there anything that we can do to decrease that risk? So SCAD is scary. Um, and you'd think this was like a lightning strike. Unfortunately, the research has shown that probably women have about a two to 3% per year risk of having another heart attack from SCAD. So I tell patients, control your blood pressure and not just treat hypertension, but get a normal blood pressure. If that takes medication or lifestyle changes, there's a, a number of probably about 30% of women have elevated blood pressure of SCAD. But the other part is live your life like it's not gonna happen again, cause it most likely won't, but be ready if it is. So know that you're gonna call 911, not drive yourself to the heart, to the hospital. Know that you have a, a, a plan. And that's uh, that would be for anybody, but particularly for patients with SCAD. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayes. Um, I'm gonna return to Alexis's story. So after her diagnosis, she was observed in the hospital for several days and started on aspirin and a medication for her heart rate control. Um, she's told to follow up with her cardiologist. However, she's overwhelmed with this new diagnosis as well as her growing family. She's currently awaiting her follow-up with her general practitioner to address this. Um, next slide. So what does life look like after a pregnancy complication? The fourth trimester is a common entity which has received appropriately increased attention over the years to improve education and understanding of the emotional effects during the first three months after delivery. What is less discussed is what we would like to uh, coin the fifth trimester, although a misnomer to extend beyond three months up until menopause. This is an important period for mothers who are often no longer pursuing regular follow-up for themselves, resulting in a significant and dangerous gap in healthcare. This is a vulnerable per period um, when there tends to be fragmented care, resulting in the increased risk of undiagnosed medical conditions. And it's a higher risk period for women who have had complications of pregnancies. As we have discussed, pregnancy can tend to be a stress test of sorts that uncovers the risk of developing future heart disease, um, including chronic hypertension, diabetes, stroke, and heart failure. These conditions can often lay silent for many years before developing long-term effects on the body and therefore should be monitored for on at least an annual basis, depending on your past medical history as well as family history. Next slide, please. The American Heart Association uh, created the Life Simple 7 to improve overall health. This primary prevention effort is especially helpful for high-risk patients such as Black and Hispanic people who are already at a higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease at an earlier age. Um, with women who have had complications in pregnancy, we also recommend additional steps, including establishing care with a general practitioner that you have a good relationship. This is crucial with a particular focus on developing a multidisciplinary care team including other healthcare professionals such as social workers, pharmacists, doulas, et cetera. Second, it's important to acknowledge issues such as the superwoman schema and understand the risks you have in your life and how to minimize them and what to monitor for going forward. Next slide. All right, so I will begin. Uh, my name is Dr. Branch. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, so Alexis is, uh, she's now 45 years old and has she has not seen her physician since her diagnosis of SCAD due to life getting in the way. Um, she's developing hot flashes, mood swings, and vaginal dryness, um, affecting her intimacy with her husband. 
she decides to make an appointment with her OBGYN to inquire about hormone therapy. In addition, uh, transportation is an issue and the doctor's office is not always as welcoming, making this a real task. Um, so I'll begin with some questions. First, I'll start with um, Dr. Johnson. So Dr. Amber Johnson, what are some barriers that you've seen in your clinic with, in terms of with African-American women when it comes to access to care and receiving uh, equitable treatment? That's a great question. Uh, access to care does get a fair amount of attention as being a barrier, especially for uh, communities of color, for minoritized individuals. But I think access is a little bit of a misnomer. I think it's more the accessibility of the care. I think that, uh, and there have been a, a, a good amount of data to support that being able to access, being proximate, close enough to the hospital is not enough. It's not just about being able to get to the hospital. And sometimes it's not even about being insured. We do know that under insurance is a huge problem in this country and the distribution of insurance and, and being able to, to work in order to get insurance. We all know that those things are, are barriers potentially. However, even when people are fully insured fully capable of getting to the hospital. There are certain other barriers um, despite access. And so I think that accessibility piece hasn't received enough attention. For example, for uh, community members who are of uh, limited uh, English proficiency. So for example, if English is not your, your first or second uh, language, you may have some accessibility issues. You may be able to download your health systems app on your phone so you have access to it. But if it's not in the language that you are able to speak and understand fully, then that's an accessibility issue, right? So I think that um, for women of color, being able to get to a physician who is able to communicate with you effectively, who will believe what you're saying when you describe your symptoms, those are things that as a health system, we really need to do better. And I think that the people on this panel probably all agree and the people who are listening right now probably all agree, but how do we really move the needle so that we make healthcare accessible for all? Um, some of those, the, the ideas that have al already been proposed this evening include as healthcare providers, we need to listen to women. We need to listen to what they're describing and we need to take them seriously. Uh, we need to have uh, ways to overcome our biases so that we don't see a woman of color and automatically think a particular diagnosis, but that we actually expand our, our thinking and we think about SCAD. SCAD is relatively rare, but if we don't think about it, we won't diagnose it. We won't send them for the appropriate testing. And as women age, we know that uh, being perimenopausal and postmenopausal are risk factors for developing heart disease. However, a lot of cardiologists, a lot of primary care doctors don't really think about that as a risk factor. And so we, uh, our, our societies, our, our guidelines need to do a better job of highlighting how important being perimenopausal is uh, when it comes to developing heart disease. Thank you, those are very important points. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're, during, we're in this era of sort of COVID-19 where um, certainly it's been devastating, but there's been a little bit of a silver lining in that we've kind of tapped in a little bit to telehealth and being able to reach our patients kind of uh, through electronics. Have you found that telehealth has at all improved your interaction with patients and your, your ability to kind of follow up with patients? How has that been for you? So telehealth has been great in a lot of ways. Uh, I think across the country and probably across the world, we found that telehealth utilization has skyrocketed. We've really gone from majority face-to-face -face visits to majority telehealth visits. And we've done it in a very short time period. So our capability has really ramped up quickly. And I think we've kind of impressed ourselves at how quickly we were able to adapt as health systems and patients tend to like it as well. So I do think that the promise of using technology is, is really great. However, we know that there are some social determinants that overlap as we talked about accessibility, right? So if you don't have internet access, um, 
being in a rural environment can limit your accessibility because you, you don't have broadband internet access. So you can't call it, you can't have a, a telehealth visit with your cardiologist. Um, and also some of my patients that I see in my own clinic, I've noticed that older patients may not have the tech savvy to do uh, a telehealth visit. Um, unfortunately, certain health systems may not have the telehealth um, visit capability in, in more than one language. So if you don't speak English well, or if you don't have internet access for a number of reasons, a smartphone, et cetera, et cetera. So as I'm outlining, there are a number of barriers with telehealth. And what I've seen in my own practice is unfortunately, if a patient is unable to come in to the hospital to be seen face to face, then I may do a telephone visit. And telephone visits are okay, but it's a little bit limited in that I'm not able to see the patient. I'm not able to make eye contact with, with the patient if it's a telephone visit, and I'm really unable to do a physical exam. And so as we described in Alexis's case, being able to listen to their heart and their lungs are, are very important in diagnosing certain things like peripartum cardiomyopathy. And so there are some limitations um, with telehealth. Excellent, thank you. Um, this next question goes to Dr. Hayes. So um, Dr. Hayes, in terms of utilizing technology to kind of reach our uh, community, um, we've uh, read about your um, faith-based app uh, out of Mayo Clinic, uh, spearheaded by Dr. LaPrincess Brewer. Can you tell us a little bit about how this app has improved uh, patient engagement in the community? So Dr. Brewer, who is a close colleague of mine, um, who has really uh, is the bright star here, in uh, creating an app with the aim, because faith is fostering African-American total health. So putting together an app that was completely integrated um, and contributed by, with multiple areas of feedback by the community and the community is faith community. So a number of African-American churches in the Rochester, Minnesota and the Minneapolis, St. Paul area. And so, it came from a trusted partner, right? Because people were going to, they believed what was coming out of it and it was integrated in their life, their daily life of faith, wanting to be healthier. It was led by their pastors with expert input by obviously Dr. La Princess Brewer and I. And so what that did is put into the hands on a phone or an iPad, the opportunity to learn about um, better eating, more exercise, to track it, to join the community, because there actually was a, an online community. So I think going forward, recognizing that people want to hear the kind of news from trusted sources, right? They may want to hear it from a doctor, but they want it validated by people who they know and trust and are already work with. So I think that the Faith app has been able to leverage that. Now, the other advantage that we had is because we already had a relationship with these churches is when COVID came and we were able to, we already had a trusted relationship. And so we recognized they don't have access to um, quick turnaround COVID testing and many were frontline workers. So the other um, advantage of that partnership, honestly, is being able to, in a crisis, meet the needs and, and hear about those needs. Other options are more in-person or individual, like Women Heart, the National Coalition for, um, for Women with Heart Disease has support networks across the US. So when you ha are scared and have just been diagnosed with a heart attack or some other heart disease, you can reach out to their website and join a group which, are on, which also went immediately online. Um, so there are many ways that women can find support and I urge them to seek out that support and not feel alone and afraid at home. Wonderful, thank you so much. <clears throat> so I'm gonna continue kind of with our research here. So research has shown that women of color tend to enter perimenopause and menopause earlier than their white counterparts. Perimenopause is the time when your ovaries start to make less eggs and you begin to develop symptoms of menopause. Uh, menopause is when your ovaries actually stop making eggs. You're no longer ovulating and your menses stops. Um, the symptoms that you can have in menopause include, include what we call vasomotor symptoms, so hot flashes, vaginal dryness, um, and this may be an indication that you're entering menopause. Experiencing menopause um, 
in your mid forties can actually be a sign that you may be at an increased risk of heart disease, such as heart attack or even heart failure and stroke. Um, compared to those who experience menopause or closer to the average age. So if you're having menopause earlier, this may be a sign that you may be at increased risk of heart disease. Next slide, please. The difference of timing in menopause between African-Americans and Caucasians is not entirely understood. Uh, there are different proposed reasons. Uh, one, uh, we have small differences in our genetic code, and this can explain why some African-American women experience menopause, can tend to spend, uh, experience menopause at an earlier age compared to our different racial counterparts. Uh, however, the greatest impact on the age of menopause is likely related to what we call epigenetic changes. So epigenetic changes refer to uh, DNA changes that occur after we are born. So changes in DNA, um, can occur related to stress, our environment, or even diet. Uh, these changes can impact the age of menopause, and this ultimately is linked to uh, accelerated aging. Um, so uh, my next set of questions, I'm gonna begin with uh, Dr. Shepard. Dr. Shepard, can you tell me a little bit about what symptoms uh, your uh, women patients have when they're experiencing uh, menopause? Um, and in terms of uh, Dr. Alexis, or in terms of Alexis's desire to start hormone therapy, um, how do you advise them about which type of hormone therapy to start? Should they start oral or should they start transdermal? Does one have less risk with her, uh, cardiovascular disease? Can you touch a little bit about hormone therapy and heart disease as well? Yeah, absolutely. So hormone therapy, we know that uh, for a lot of times since the WHI study was, you know, kind of got a bad name and patients were unable to really get a, a really good understanding of how that could be beneficial for them. And so now that we're so far out from WHI and we kind of know that looking back at that study that there were a lot of different opportunities for women to have hormonal support and also to make sure that we're protecting their heart. We know that estrogen is actually very uh, protective of the heart and heart disease. Now, when patients have, um, whether they're perimenopausal or menopausal, I, th I believe that we should really provide them with some type of therapy, uh, even before they're technically menopausal, which is the 12 months uh, in duration of not having a period. So I usually run those, those options for patients, whether that's oral or transdermal. Um, now there is talk of, you know, bioidentical hormones and the use of that. There are some that are for and some that are against. But even now we have a bioidentical uh, hormone in the form of a pill uh, that came up for pharmaceutical very recently. And so these are the options that all women should have, but also knowing their risk prior to starting any of these medications. Um, to make sure that they have a, an understanding of what they can start with, what they can transition to if they don't get the desired effects from the hormone that they start on. Excellent, thank you. And the next question, uh, Dr. Johnson. So uh, as a cardiologist, you know, when should women um, see you when they're thinking about starting a hormone therapy, when you're thinking about cardiovascular uh, risk? And also, is there a certain age when that risk, that cardiovascular disease risk with hormone therapy might be a little bit lower? Or is there a certain time when starting hormone therapy might increase your risk even more uh, for heart disease? Can you expand a little bit on that? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, as it relates to this case, I think that um, the cat's a little bit out of the bag now, right, for Alexis, because she's got heart disease. And what we're talking about is trying to prevent the development of heart disease. We know that a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy is a risk factor for additional uh, pregnancy complications and a subsequent pregnancy. And we also know that as women who have had these complications as they age, that their increased, their, their risk for developing cardiovascular disease is increased. And so in Alexis's case for, for younger women, during the pregnancy, she should have been identified as high risk. Um, if you are at a facility that has maternal fetal medicine, so those are the types of um, obstetricians who treat patients who have higher risk pregnancies, the MFM should have referred her to cardiology. And that's how I see the majority of my pregnant patients is that MFM 
have deemed this woman to be high risk. And so she comes to see me during the pregnancy. And I really think that that's the ideal time to establish care because while you're pregnant, you are coming in, you've got no, a number of visits anyway. So adding one more visit to see the cardiologist or you know maybe a couple more if you need some testing isn't so burdensome, but it is hard to follow up with specialists after you've delivered because you have a little baby and you know your priorities change and you start to think less about yourself, unfortunately. I think a lot of my 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 female patients, they are they'll come in having had a heart attack, right? Like they had chest pain last week, but it was Christmas, so they needed to spend time with their family. And I, I'm thinking of one particular person right now because I've had this patient, I've had a number of patients mm -hmm. like this. And it's not uncommon to see this type of pattern where women will prioritize their families or their friends or everyone else before prioritizing themselves. Now, Just when it- add, Oh, sorry to Dr. Uh, Johnson. Oh, that is ahead. so important that uh, during the postpartum or the pregnancy phase, whether it's, I know we're talking about heart disease tonight, but even with diabetes is sometimes those conversations don't start early enough. And so when it becomes something that comes up in the future, it's almost as if it, it's something new. But if, if we can allow people to start these conversations very early, um, so that one, they can do a lot of preventative type of therapy prior to possibly getting the disease state in the, in the future, but also starting the conversation and allowing patients to understand that this is something that could happen in the future and to be on the lookout for, it, but also to participate from their perspective in their care from an early stage. Yes, that's so true. Thank you for those comments. Um, because once you start that conversation, once you've established care with a cardiologist, my perspective at least is, even if we don't diagnose you with something, even if you don't have heart disease, then you've at least established care. You started that conversation and you start to think about preventative steps so that you don't develop um, cardiovascular disease or diabetes, or you know, you keep your health, your 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 weight at a healthy weight, and you do all of those lifestyle modifications that we know will add years to your life. So now that we're at the point that our patient is perimenopausal, um, as Dr. Branch has mentioned, being less than 45 when you go through the menopause transition does increase your risk of developing heart disease. Now, why is that? Well, we know that, that the changes in hormones where you have less estrogen, more androgens, that is what increases, we, we think that that is what increases your risk of developing heart disease. Whereas um, estrogen is protective, the lack of estrogen is uh, detrimental. And so if you're doing that at an earlier age, then that means your risk of developing heart disease will increase and the time that you are spent post-menopausal is longer. The average age at which women go through that menopause transition is about 50 years. So if you're younger than that, it's considered early or premature. Um, and thinking about using hormone replacement therapy, um, as, as Dr. Shepard had mentioned, there are some, some um, benefits of using it. When we start to think about the risk factors of using it, um, those really have to do with <laughs> Sorry, my my daughter's being really loud in the background. Real life. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're 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 live here, folks. <laughs> um, so the 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 detriments of using uh, hormone therapy are really having to do with the duration at which you're using it. So if you're on hormone therapy for longer than ten years, then that will increase your risk of developing heart disease. Um, although the the data haven't really explained how that is. There's some um, thought that maybe it has to do with blood clots, maybe it has to do with stroke. So we, I can't really say for sure the extent to which being on hormone therapy will increase your risk, but we know that there's some signal there. So it's better to stay on hormone replacement therapy for a shorter duration if possible. And it's also better to stay on it to um, initiate it around the normal age of when someone would go through menopause, right? So if we're saying that going through menopause at age 45 is abnormally early, if you're starting hormone replacement therapy abnormally early, then that is also associated with, with risks. And so 
the long and short of it is that if you're going to be on hormone replacement therapy for those, um, you know, the, the terrible symptoms of the hot flashes and um, depression and, and all of the things that we know make menopause unbearable, then that's fine, but try to limit the time that you're on it. Also, it's really important to not think about hormone replacement therapy as a, a good or bad thing when it comes to heart disease, because the data don't support being on hormone replacement therapy specifically for heart disease. You're, you're not using it to treat heart disease, so to speak. So it would really be to treat the symptoms of menopause and that's it. And trying to stay on it for a shorter duration, because if you're on it for longer then that could increase your risk of developing heart disease. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Shepard and Dr. Johnson. Um, so we'll move along with the case here. Next slide, please. All right. So uh, during her visit, Alexis's physician conducts a thorough physical examination and identifies a hard breast lump and lymph nodes under her arm. A mammogram is concerning for breast cancer and a biopsy confirms the diagnosis. She undergoes treatment with chemotherapy. Next slide, please. Um, so the American Cancer Society reports that African-American women have a higher risk of death with breast cancer compared to their white counterparts. Uh, this disparity is actually stronger and younger uh, at a younger age, so less than 50 years of age. So there's a higher rate of mortality with breast cancer in African-American women. And this um, discrepancy is higher at, at younger ages, less than 50. Um, this is partially related to the fact that African-American women present to the doctor uh, at a later stage of cancer and also are at higher risk of more aggressive, what we call sort of triple negative breast cancers. Uh, the reasoning that there's a higher risk of these triple negative breast cancers is actually pretty multifactorial. Uh, the literature has described the impact of stress on breast cancer hormone type. Also, African-American women have more risk factors for breast cancer as well, so that takes a, plays a role. Uh, these include sedentary lifestyle, um, so societal and sort of cultural factors uh, play a role in that risk. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so there's actually a study done uh, led by a Howard University group um, published in the American Journal of Epidemiology, uh, where they followed 59,000 African-American women for six years and questioned them about racial discrimination. They also uh, assessed development of breast cancer in this group. Those that had increased incidence of racial discrimination had associated increased risk of developing breast cancer. This link, again, is stronger in women that was younger than uh, the 50 years of age or younger. So that disparity existed in younger women. Next slide, please. Uh, so Alexis returns eight weeks after chemotherapy is initiated with shortness of breath and leg swelling and is diagnosed with heart failure. Her cancer therapy needs to be stopped. Alexis is overwhelmed. Next slide, please. Um, so certain breast cancer therapies such as anthracyclines and Herceptin for HER2 positive breast cancer have a risk of causing heart pumping dysfunction. This is known as cardiotoxicity. Those, these breast cancer therapies are life-saving. However, if your heart pumping function gets very low, you may have to stop cancer treatment. It is important that your oncologist works with a cardiologist to determine when this is absolutely necessary, when it's absolutely necessary to stop chemotherapy. The goal of the cardiologist and the oncologist is to keep women on cancer therapy as long as possible. There's actually a group of uh, physicians known as cardio-oncologists who focus on this issue. Next slide, please. Just briefly, there are other uh, cancer, breast cancer treatments that can also affect the heart. This includes um, radiation therapy and uh, surgery as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in African-American women, there's actually a threefold increased risk for heart, heart pumping dysfunction after exposure to certain breast cancer therapies compared to their white counterparts. Overall, uh, these cancer therapies are associated with about a 20% risk for reduced heart pumping function, so 20 out of 100, and a 3% risk of heart failure, so three out of 100. For African-American women, this is threefold higher. Um, and studies comparing uh, African-American women this is, has been shown to be significant. One study found that because heart dysfunction occurred more in African-American women, they were less likely to complete their cancer therapies. This can be another reason why we are seeing a disparity in breast cancer death rates in African-American women. Um, it's currently unknown why this disparity exists and heart uh, pumping dysfunction between African-American women and Caucasian women. 
but certain factors include hypertension, genetics, and again, these societal factors. So hypertension, uh, there's higher rates of hypertension within the African-American community, and hypertension is associated with risk of cardiotoxicity. Uh, potentially genetics play a role. There's a molecule called nitric oxide um, that can be lower within African-Americans and potentially this could uh, increase risk of cardiotoxicity, but this all again links to uh, putting those at risk for hypertension. So this is a very important uh, component to, to keep in mind. Also societal factors, again, access to care, things that Dr. Johnson has already sort of mentioned um, that sort of limit uh, access to, to healthcare can also increase risk of, of cardiotoxicity as well. If you're not monitoring uh, patients, if you're not monitoring their blood pressure, uh, they can be at risk for cardiotoxicity and we just don't know because we're not seeing these folks. Um, so beyond race, all groups are susceptible to both heart disease and breast cancer with increased age, poor diet, family history of either disease, hormone therapy, sedentary lifestyle, and smoking. Next slide, please. All right. So to summarize for our audience, we had a 40-year-old Alexis who had a baby. Then one month later, she experienced a spontaneous coronary artery dissection known as SCAD. She's lost the follow-up due to life. And then five years later, she shows up at her primary care physician's office due to signs and symptoms of menopause. During the physical exam, her exam reveals that she has a lump. She's worked up further and found to have breast cancer. So then she undergoes chemotherapy. And then two months later, presents with heart failure type of symptoms. So my next question is directed to Dr. Parapid. Could you kindly just tell us about heart failure, what it is, how it's diagnosed and treatment for heart failure, Dr. Parapid? Thank you, Dr. Ansong. Well, uh, to begin with, uh, we all know that she was obese and she had hypertension, meaning she already had predisposing factors to develop something that is called cardiomyopathy, meaning a gradual propensity to developed failing of the heart as pumping muscle. Consequently, in that setting, as someone who has lost a follow-up, whose risk factors were not treated along the years, in the setting where she was treated for her, for her breast cancer, she had a higher risk also for developing heart failure and it is usually diagnosed during an echocardiogram, which shows a reduced ejection fraction. And normally we treat it with diuretics and ACE inhibitors. Thank you, Dr. And did Alex's prior history of heart disease make her outcome worse after being treated with chemotherapy for heart failure? Sadly, yes, because uh, all the factors that she has frankly neglected, because I know we can be sometimes too nagging for our patients, and when they don't really see that there is a, something missing on the outside or there is a, uh, an ankle that you twist or something, our patients are generally very hard to convince that something is diabetes, obesity, and hypertension can cause long-term damage that coupled with therapies that are life-saving, like chemotherapy in this particular case, it just decreases their chances of coping in the long-term. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Parapid. My next question is for Dr. Branch. So Dr. Branch, with the cancer diagnosis, which typically involves the oncologist and the radiation specialist, and given Alex's history, when should cardiology have been brought in? Yeah, so I think, um, I think it's important to consider sort of Alexis's history and that she had increased cardiovascular risk factors, including hypertension. So I think just knowing that she has risk factor for heart disease and she's planned for chemotherapy that is known to cause cardiotoxicity. And now that we know that there's a racial disparity, I think at that point, it's never too early actually to involve the cardiologist or the cardio-oncologist, especially if her blood pressure uh, is not well controlled and well managed and they need some help with that. The cardiologist can begin with sort of managing the blood pressure, 
and also scheduling sort of a surveillance schedule where uh, she can do surveillance um, ultrasound of the heart, what we call an echocardiogram, to see if there's any subtle changes in the heart function. If there are subtle changes that we see, we can actually start certain medications to try to help prevent that cardiotoxicity, which is that overt heart pumping failure. Um, so if we can do that, we can do our best to keep Alexis on, um, on chemotherapy as long as possible. And that's certainly our goal in her case. And then moving forward, what would her treatment plan be like? And when would it be safe to, for her to resume chemotherapy? That's an excellent question. And I think that requires sort of a multidisciplinary team with the cardiologist and with the uh, oncologist as well. So certainly if her heart pumping function gets so bad where she's having symptoms, shortness of breath, or her heart pumping function is very, very weak, then she certainly has to stop therapy. But we can uh, start sort of therapies that we use for heart failure, continue to monitor her heart pumping function. If over time the heart pumping function gets better, then we may be able to re-challenge her with um, chemotherapy, especially if her, her cancer is advancing. So it's really a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, and that's why it's important to always work with a team, which would include a Thank you, Dr. Branch. And Dr. Shepard, as Dr. Branch had mentioned earlier, African American women tend to screen later for, for breast cancer. What should standard breast cancer screening be? For standard breast uh, cancer screening, that starts with, I'm trying to start my video. Let me see if it will work now. Uh, the host has to let me, but I'll keep talking. The, you know, the mammogram recommendations for screening start at the age of 40. Now, what we do know is that these recommendations are most likely going to start changing in the next few years, because when we look at actual age and not actual, uh, not only age rather, but actually the type of cancer, for example, tri triple negative cancer is seen actually more likely in black females at a younger age. We find that those parameters are gonna have to change. now. Um, you know, for me, whether it's cervical cancer, breast cancer, uterine cancer, what we do know is the screening should always be more appropriate, including and being inclusive of Black women because we're finding that they have a younger age at which they're diagnosed with more aggressive cancers, um, namely among the ones that I just mentioned. And so recently, and this is a little bit off topic, but cervical cancer screening recommendations were uh, proposed to be changed to a higher age. And again, these are the reasons why we need to be big, you know, advocates for our black women, because if we did change the age to, you know, uh, older age rather than younger, we are going to miss so many more women when it comes to screening for cancers, especially when they have those uh, more aggressive cancers at a younger age. So that should start at the age of 40. If you have a significant family member, again, that family member being a first degree relative, namely a mother or sister, you would want to start that age in the 30s. And if they did have a diagnosis that was much younger than 50, then you would want to start 10 years prior to their diagnosis and namely will do other things such as ultrasound and MRI um, at a younger age, and then uh, factoring into um, the mammogram at a younger age as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Shepard. And last question for Dr. Branch. How can the field of cardio oncology, so where we have our cardiac specialist and our cancer specialist, sort of bridge the gap in our vulnerable populations? That's an excellent question. That's actually a field that I'm interested in. It's a new sort of uh, burning field. So um, essentially cardio-oncologists understand uh, these specific types of heart disease that are associated with different chemotherapy agents. And some of our cardiology colleagues may not be uh, as aware of all of the different side effects that cancer therapies can cause, um, kind of can impact the heart. Um, and so it's really important to have someone who understands uh, cancer therapy, as well as cardiovascular disease, and understands how to uh, sort of come up with a uh, surveillance plan, a monitoring plan to make sure that uh, patients are continuing on their chemotherapy, but also are protected and are up to date with all of the data that um, we need to ensure that we're treating these patients with the medications that are going to be effective for them. And so a cardio-oncologist really has a special role in this uh, specific patient population. Heart disease and cancer are the two sort of competing causes of death. And so having someone who has an expertise in both is certainly essential. Thank you. And I think you're up, Dr. Branch. 
Yeah, so we'll move on to Alexis's story. So uh, she's referred to a cardiologist who is now part of her care team. Uh, she started on appropriate medications and eventually her heart pumping function recovers and she's able to get back on her cancer treatment. So after treatment and close follow-up and support, she's told she's in remission. So finally, some good news for her. Uh, so next slide, please. So as cancer therapies are improving, uh, women are living longer uh, with diagnosis of breast cancer, but we need to keep in mind that heart disease is the number one cause of death in the United States for breast cancer survivors. So older women still the number one cause of death is still heart disease. So that's something that we need to continue to keep in mind, even though your cancer therapy is treated and you're doing well, you wanna to continue to follow along with that cardiologist to make sure that your risk for heart disease doesn't increase. Next slide, please. So again, this circles back to that life simple seven. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through each, each one, but uh, th these are very important factors. And for one, within the African-American community, I really, really want to stress blood pressure. So especially when we're trying to reduce risk of cardiotoxicity. So, you know, know your status, know your blood pressure status, check it once a day or at least a couple times a week, the same time every day uh, when you're at rest and relaxed and keep a log of it so that you know and make sure that you bring it to your doctor so we can uh, manage it closely. Next slide, please. Um, so the Association of Black Cardiologists, we actually added a couple um, more steps that are a little bit more relevant to our patient population. So one is act, making sure that you have access to better care. So take advantage of any healthcare benefits provided by your employer or through uh, the health insurance marketplace. Um, everyone, no matter how healthy, should see their doctor every one to three years. So really, after you see your OBGYN, if you had risk factors, or even if you didn't, your next appointment should be your primary care doctor to continue that, um, that relationship with the, uh, with the medical field. And then also uh, within our community, spirituality and reducing stress is extremely important. We've learned a lot about the impacts of stress and heart disease and cancer. And so it's important to uh, practice uh, worship if you're a religious person or spirituality um, and also mindfulness and, and reducing stress. Next slide, please. So here are just some resources and references. And next slide. Oh, so thank you so much. We're actually at this. We're actually at the summary of our talk today. And I think we've learned so much just through Alexis's journey. We wanted to end in a really positive note by really providing you with three key areas. One, how to engage during the first, really the fifth trimester and beyond. And the first step is to engage. Um, we encourage you to discuss race, your feelings, your stress, your fears, and also acknowledge the daily impact that this has on you, both physically, but more importantly, mentally. We also want to make sure that you master by understanding your risks and those seven steps that Dr. Jaroge as well as Dr. Branch so eloquently addressed. And lastly, we want to make sure that you activate your team, including your healthcare team, insist that you have that collaboration between your obstetrician, your gynecologist and oncologist if that's necessary. And making sure that that collaboration is there with the cardiologist, um, really at the core of the care team, if it's not already included in the care. Next slide, please. Now, we do have a five minutes, um, but we wanted to open it up for any questions and answers from the audience. And I think that we may have one or, or a few questions. Um, and we can absolutely expand. And we really wanna open this up to the panel at this point in time, both myself and Dr. Ansong are gonna expand on a few of the questions that we had wanted to engage the panel ourselves, but I'm actually for now gonna open it up. If there's anything that the panelists wanted to say that perhaps we didn't give you the opportunity to say, I leave it up to you. And as I pull up the questions that we ourselves were planning on asking, um, I do want to highlight the fact that Alexis, at the end of the day, there were so many areas that we as a healthcare society could have helped Alexis a little bit more. I think the biggest part was just the health literacy, explaining to her 
what her what her conditions are and what the follow through is. And that's really the intent of this was to really make sure that we provided you with the tools to make sure that you're empowered to ask questions to your healthcare providers. And more importantly, make sure that your voice was not dismissed and that your concerns were actually more, no, more so noted. And that's really our first question. If a black woman is faced with a dismissive attitude from her healthcare provider, what should she do? And I leave that um, to perhaps Dr. Johnson to lead in terms of the discussion. What do you think she should do? Or what do you, what would it, what advice would you provide those listening in today? That's an excellent question. And I think it comes up a fair amount in these types of forums. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, the, the guidelines, the, 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 rhetoric that comes out from different societies is that patients need to advocate for themselves. And while I do agree that that's true, I think that puts a lot of the onus on the patients, right? It tells the patients that it's up to you to save your own life. And I think that that is, uh, it's burdensome, right? It, it adds to the burden that you're already feeling. Um, you definitely should get as much education about the, your conditions or your symptoms as you can. You should try to use reliable sources. So, you know, don't just Google it, but go to the American Heart Association or go to the list of resources that we posted on the previous slide um, so that you can try to engage with what you feel might be going on and then take that information with you to your doctor's appointment. Um, I think that it's a double-edged sword though, coming in equipped with education because you don't wanna come out the gate too aggressive, right? No, no physician wants to be boxed into a corner. And I think that there is, it could be detrimental if you are coming across as, as too aggressive. At the same time, I know that physicians can be dismissive. And so I think if you are faced with a dismissive physician, if you're finding that you're not being listened to, if you're finding that you're being talked down to, then that is not a therapeutic relationship. That is not the doctor for you. Um, and so you can try to find a, a different opinion or even uh, if you feel comfortable in bringing someone with you who can help to advocate for you, maybe someone who is an actual patient advocate, maybe someone from your church, like um, Dr. Hayes uh, has mentioned, um, finding people within your network who can come with you to your appointment. Sometimes that's helpful to kind of empower you to ask those questions that you need, or maybe they might remind you, like, remember you had that one symptom that one time? Because it's hard when you're in the visit to remember all of those details. Um, come with notes, come with questions so that you know what you need to ask and be sure that those questions are being answered. If you leave that visit and you're just not satisfied, that is the time to find someone new because there may be a better doctor out there for you. Um, it can be hard to find people who may have the same cultural background as you, um, but going online doing searches, asking around, asking your, your friends, your colleagues who they see, sometimes that's a good way to find uh, someone who might meet your needs as well. Thank you so much. And Dr. Hayes, do you, would you like to expand on that? I would, and I completely agree with what Dr. Johnson said, um, because sometimes you just do need to move on, right? Uh, to, to somebody who you can gel with. We don't get along with everybody and neither do physicians. So sometimes it's just not a good match. I, I'd have two other things to add. One was healthcare providers are people too. They have bad days too. And so one thing I tell patients who are appalled by what their doctor or a nurse said to them to take a step back and actually think about them as a person and give them one more chance. Not another visit necessarily, but but remember, it's high, it's very high stakes. And I think on one hand, it's sort of unfair to ask the sick person, but I also being in the other and seeing many of my amazing colleagues and then having some patient um, complain about them. And I know them well enough to know they were having a really bad day. So we all have bad days. So, um, so that would be one thing is, is, is find some connection that you can, you know, do you have a dog? Do you have a kid? You know, maybe we could start this visit over because I, I think it's going south for me as a patient. Um, and I think the, the, other, um, the other is don't be afraid to move to someone else. I've had so many patients who have 
told me that they stayed with someone who um, who disrespected them, who did not listen, who dismissed. It was like the people who won't change their hair hairstylist. Like I don't want to hurt their feelings, even though I get a bad cut every time. So, so I think that's the other thing is we as often as women are not willing to, we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. So on the one hand, listen to the feelings. Maybe that doc or nurse is having a bad day. But if you if you're feeling it in your gut, this is not the right thing, don't feel guilty about walking away. This is your health, which is the most important thing that you have. And to expand on that, there is a question from the audience on how can you do that in a hospital setting? So a lot of what we've talked about is more outpatient clinical settings, but what about in a hospital setting if you feel that you're, you're being dismissed or you're not being listened to? A lot of hospitals have patient advocates who, can, uh, who the patients can tap into. Um, by simply maybe asking the nurse or asking for the charge nurse who can connect them with that or some type of a budsman where there, there's a complaint, um, it gets sent to them. And then hopefully with that relationship, your issues and concerns can be addressed. Yeah, I would just say that in the hospital, you're far less dependent on the doctor, actually. Um, it's not that one-on-one -on -one visit. There's so many staff and I agree. Um, but tapping into the, the bedside nurse, and if the bedside nurse is the problem, then there's going to be somebody else coming in who you can reach out to. So it's harder because you're a captive audience. You're not going to walk away from that. But um, I think the other uh, advantage is often there are really many more staff you could probably find allies with. Thank you so much. And we do, in the interest of time, want to be very thoughtful of everyone's time being we're getting to the end of this wonderful webinar. I do want to give both Dr. Parapid and Dr. Shepard an opportunity to expand on the discussions we've had or at least elaborate on anything else that you felt would be important for us to end this off with. So Dr. Parapid, would you like to go first? I'll, I'll, I'll let Dr. Shepard, because we were happy that she made it on time, share something, give her some more space, and then I'll add a sentence, and that's it. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Um, you know, as a gynecologist, one of the things uh, that we've realized over the years is that women come to us naturally uh, because they start very early on in their lives, but many times they build a relationship with their gynecologist, and this starts to uh, go into their, their later years, 40s, 50s, 60s. What I want, um, if anyone's watching here, um, from the audience is that you still can have a really good relationship with your gynecologist, but also heart disease, again, is the number one killer of women in the US. And these are still very important topics that have to be addressed, even if your gynecologist technically might be your PCP. Heart disease is very, uh, one of those things where it, it kind of uh, doesn't appear to be something that you might feel or that you uh, feel bad about. Um, or have symptoms that makes your quality of life change. It still requires a constant conversation because even outside of significant family history um, or having uh, lifestyle factors such as obesity or diabetes, comorbidities, um, you really have to have the awareness to know that heart disease is impacting you as a woman and that should still be brought up in your well woman visit. Um, if you feel that you're not getting the attention, I'm glad that that was brought up earlier, getting the attention that you feel that you need outside of your gynecological care, then you definitely need to seek the advice of a, a primary care physician in order to further the conversation because you really are the, ad the best advocate for yourself uh, when it comes to your health. Um, so as a gynecologist, that probably is what I can add to such a wonderful panel of um, very brilliant uh, doctors. And I think that, you know, we are often un underestimated as far as uh, being a gynecologist um, and knowing heart disease. But the other thing is I hope that through these types of conversations, we can continue to partner um, between cardiologists, uh, primary care physicians and gynecologists in order to optimize women's health, especially when it comes to heart health. And especially when we're talking about menopause, because most women will come to see us with the symptoms and we really need to do it in an approach where we're collective so that we can get the patient the best outcome, better quality of life, but not impacting their heart health in a way that would be negative for them. Thank you so much. And Dr. Parapid. 
Yeah, absolutely. I echo Dr. Shepard. I think that we should just fortify our alliances because we're all very busy. We're all living the administrative burden, no matter in which country we practice. And uh, RVUs came to this country also. <laughs> so um, we're still not paid by RVUs, but <laughs> soon enough we'll, we'll, we'll be once COVID over, most likely. So let's just try to be kind to each other like our parents taught us when we were kids in kindergarten to, to you know s split our lunch with uh, the friend who who dropped his in the somewhere in the courtyard or something like that and uh, another thing our patients we have also we look at these screens all the time what i try to do especially if i have a double triple clinic and things like that when i start typing my report because in, in serbia patients have to leave with the technical physical report in their hands and I usually there, of course, it's always a crazy day. <laughs> there is never a normal day. I usually say, is there something that I haven't asked you and that you want to share with me, especially if they're first comers? You know, patients who see me for third, fourth time or who know me for years, they, they open up more easily. But I think and emphasize the fact that you're looking at the screen. We were trained to multitask, so I'm still listening to you. And I think it helps up. Thank you so much. It's been an amazing evening and, and thanks again for, for inviting me. Thank you so much. If we can pull up the slideshow, that would be fantastic because we do want in our closing remarks to highlight a few of the upcoming events that we will be having through the ABC. Again, the Association of Black Cardiologists, and I do believe that we did include the website in our chat box so you can easily have access. But one of the upcoming events will be our 2021 ABC Annual Education Program and Dr. J. Brown Best Abstract Competition. This is something that I know that our cardiovascular fellows are very engaged in. Beyond that, if you could move the slide forward, we have another uh, fantastic event, which is called Her Heart Summit, which ABC is partnering with a few other key organizations to very similar to what our Table Talk series highlights is really raise awareness of women's health in general. So that will be Saturday, May 8th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. And advancing the slide forward, we do encourage all to think about membership to the Association of Black Cardiologists. And if not membership, at least some donations and sponsorship. That way, efforts that we are doing, such as these amazing Table Talk series, we can continue to do. I do want to highlight that Dr. Beljana Parapit is one of our very new ABC members, and we're so honored and proud to have her be a part of all our discussions and all the efforts that we are doing, predominantly centered around maternal health in general. So if you are interested, there is the website. And with that, uh, thank you all so much for joining in. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you.